All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to have some people, typical to have people in and out during the uh, round table. So uh, I'm sure some more people will be uh, filling in some seats. Uh, my name is Dennis Gill with the Americans of Wartime Museum, uh, Voices of Freedom Project. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out today and supporting, the, uh, supporting us and supporting the museum. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I also want to say thank you to the veterans who, uh, who have come out today and graciously given up some of their time. Uh, to, to talk today. Um, we're going to be recording this so we can get this online for those uh, who aren't able to see it today. Uh, they'll be able to see it in the future, so, so we'll have that as well. Uh, our mission over at the Voices of Freedom is to record and preserve uh, veteran stories, either veterans who served in combat or civilians who uh, have some type of role to play in wartime uh, activities such as uh, first responders on September 11th. Uh, and things like that. Uh, Rosie the Riveters, USO Dancers, and things like that. So uh, we record all those interviews and we preserve them uh, for future uh, future use. We preserve them in the museum and also uh, the veteran and their family get a copy as well and the um, Library of Congress gets a copy as well. So today's uh, program will be centered around veterans and some of the issues uh, that they have experienced while being deployed away from their families. Um, a lot of people think, you know, the veteran comes back and he's not wounded or injured in any way, outward way, uh, that, that there's no issues. But uh, as we know from doing all the interviews that we've done, nobody returns from war the same. Nobody. So there's lots of issues that veterans deal with uh, that affects them on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's why we're here today to kind of talk about some of that stuff, to talk about uh, what these gentlemen experienced, uh, for some of them what their families had to endure. Uh, and, and hope, hopefully we can get that across to you guys. Uh, I want to introduce uh, our panelists today. Uh, starting here on my right, we have John Kimball, served in the Army from 1967 to 1970, uh, and he was in Vietnam during the Tet Offensive. Uh, he was uh, with the 13th Signal Battalion, 1st Air Cavalry Division, and he was in communication set up for forward uh, observation and communication posts uh, around the country. Uh, next we have Peter Chen. He was a Marine Corps reservist during Desert Storm and didn't see any action. Uh, so he got out and then he got back in. He joined the Army this time. Um, I don't know what's up with that. but you know. It's never the other way around. Yeah, it's never the other way around. <laughs> he served in the Army from 1995 to 2005 as a logistics officer both in Iraq and two tours in uh, Operation Enduring Freedom uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and then on the very end we have Chris Beatty. He was a Marine uh, from 2000 to 2009. Uh, he's a canine handler, and he was served in Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, and moderating the event today will be uh, Jim Bish. He's with the Voice of Freedom Project, and he comes to us from the Prince William County Public Schools. We had a very lengthy, lengthy uh, amount of service. So turn it over to him right now, Jim. Thank you, Dennis. Um, yeah, when, I, when he talked about the school system, I used to have students that said, you know, I made my four years through and then I was out. And I said, man, I was sentenced to over 30 years in that school system. So you were lucky. That wasn't a great deal. But um, today, what we're, I'm going to get let you um, deal with, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the format. Um, I'm going to go through and talk a little bit, just as an introduction, about stress in the military historically, and then some recent studies and then um, we're going to ask questions of our panelists. Each one will be able to have a chance to answer the question. So you'll get different points of view of this. Um, we'll start out with John here, and then we'll move down to Peter and Chris. And then the next question, I'll um, let Peter go first, so it's not the same person getting the first shot at it all the time. We'll kind of move that around. Um, we'll probably do that for about, about 40, 45 minutes. And then after that, we'll have 10 minutes or so that if you have any questions for our panelists, you can ask those as well at that point. So with that said, I'm gonna go through and just kind of give you a little bit of the history. This isn't something that is new, but it's relatively new as far as sophistication of knowledge about stress um, coming out of the military. The stresses of serving the military are many. In 1980, only five years, or only a few years after the end of the Vietnam War, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, 
defined as having flashbacks, upsetting memories, and anxiety following a traumatic event, was first officially recognized as a mental health condition. For hundreds of years, though, these symptoms have been described by various authors, going all the way back that we know of Shakespeare. In the 1600s, um, during, the 16th, during the 17th century, um, he described this, and other, other writers described this stress as something of a nostalgia, is what they called it, where soldiers became sad, um, and they ceased to pay attention, and became indifferent to everything that supported maintenance of normal life. Um, in the 18th century, it was often called homesickness, and um, during the American Civil War, it became the goal, known as soldier's heart or soldier's hysteria. But of course, most of us probably remember this stress coming out of World War I. That's when the industrialization of war really became prominent, and of course, the stresses amplified themselves with what was going on in the battlefield, with the mechanized machinery going on, and of course, at that time, which most of you remember, it was referred to as shell shock. Shell shock, and you've probably seen images of shell shock on documentaries and things, because that coincided with the time we could actually film people. You know, before the 19th or before the 20th century, we really didn't have photography, especially uh, motion photography. So we have examples of shell shock in many cases coming out of World War I. They estimate that as many as 40% of the casualties coming out of the Battle of the Somme in 1916 um, were shell shock victims that had no visual, physical um, situations going on, but they, they had all kinds of issues going on mentally. Um, later during World War II in Korea, it was off, it was, if it was not referred to as shell shock, it was often called combat ex exhaustion or combat fatigue where there was a breaking point in soldiers, those that were in harm's way, often reached that breaking point after days or months or years of stress. And then of course, it was not till recently, Vietnam veterans with these um, symptoms first um, had PTSD applied to them. In 1983, Congress requested a study to determine the prevalence of PTSD, and it was determined about 40 years ago that probably as many of, of 15% of all returning veterans from Vietnam had some um, signs of PTSD as it was described. And there's been a more recent study in the last 10 years that reflect not only that continuing from Vietnam war here soldiers, but also there's been more studies now for the first time dealing with stresses on the families. Because not only is the deployed under stress, but their families are under stress back here at home. And those stresses back here at home have led to an unprecedented amount of divorces and suicides and things like that. And then getting back to a normal life um, after the reunited um, families are, are back together. So that's going to be the subject of our, of our questions today, are going to deal a little bit with stress and communication with the service person over in, in the field and also what they know what was going on with the stresses on their family back in the home front. So with that starting, I'm going to start out by asking John and all of our panelists, but I'll start out with John. Um, concerning your military service, were you drafted or did you enlist? And um, tell me about those, your experience of joining the military and the reaction then from your loved ones after you knew you were you were going into the military. Um, what stresses did you see from them and what communication or lack of communication went on after that point? So John? Um, interesting question. Um, I uh, graduated from Michigan State University. I, they didn't show up for a game against Notre Dame last night, but um, <laughs> uh, in, uh, in the spring of 1967, uh, Vietnam was um, hot and heavy. We all knew that uh, the draft lottery was coming or was in, in effect and um, so a long story that's longer than you need to hear I ended up enlisting uh, in the army um, I was telling you guys earlier um, I enlisted as a public relations I, I enlisted to go to public relations officers candidate school I uh, had a degree in communications and when I got the basic training uh, the training officer looked at it and said, uh, Public Information Officers Candidate School, what the hell is that? We haven't had anything like that in 10 years. So uh, I find myself um, enlisting 
for a, a three-year stint. Um, and uh, interesting that uh, I was the first one in my family to serve in the military uh, at that time. My father was a little too old for World War II. Uh, my older brother uh, had uh, some family deferments and uh, my younger brother ended up going into the National Guard, but um, nobody in my family at that time had served uh, actively in the military, especially during wartime. Uh, it was, um, and it, uh, I think I was more, um, I don't know, nervous, anxious, something like that, about going into the Army um, than I was about eventually ending up in Vietnam. Um, by that time, I kind of figured out what the Army was all about after going through basic training and advanced training. Uh, and But the whole process of suddenly going into an environment where um, you're tossed into um, what you know and are expecting to be a pretty rigorous training operation. Um, so it was, uh, it, that was kind of unsettling to me, more than actually going to Vietnam, as it turned out. Um, what, um, how did you communicate, how was your family's reaction to you going into service? Um, well, uh, my dad, uh, I remember I was leaving um, for, uh, for Vietnam, uh, but my dad never, was not a very uh, demonstrative person, and I remember he um, gave me a hug uh, as I'm getting on the plane, and he said, just make sure you do your best. Um, my mom was uh, kind of frantic about the whole thing. Um, I had been married for a very short period of time, and um, I think my wife was more shell-shocked. <laughs> Speaking of shell-shocked, um, we've been married literally about six weeks. And, uh, but, uh, you know, communicating then was a very, there were no cell phones, there was no internet. So communication, if you were in basic training, you got in a long line to get on the payphone, um, hope that somebody on the other end would accept your the collect call. Um, my name is John Kimball, but that was during the time that the fugitive was a big television. <laughs> and I remember uh, saying this is a collect call. Uh, and I was calling my, my mom and my dad and my wife and my mom answered the phone and the operator said, I have a collect call from Dr. Richard Kimball. <laughs> she, she didn't know who that was and so she didn't accept it. <laughs> I had to start all over again. So, uh, but it was, communications were in, in uh, before I went to Vietnam, it was all uh, telephone or letters. Um, in Vietnam, it was letters and um, if you were, um, you had a chance to make a phone call, it was a ham operator station to station call. Uh -huh. uh, you had to use radio protocols, and uh, so it was, a, it was certainly a different experience than being able to. Uh, I have a son in law who's in Uganda right now with uh, humanities uh, service, and you can Skype him, you can pick up the phone, you can send him email. Uh, none of that exists. Well, thank you. Um, Peter. Yes. Um, so when, I, I think I always wanted to join the military since I was a kid, but I really didn't know what uh, I wanted to join, you know? And so, um, well, you know, growing up as an 80s kid, you kind of figure, oh, well, we're going to go to war with just the Soviet Union one day. So, you know, with that in mind, I was like, well, I uh, want to be a platoon leader. If that happens, I don't want to be a private. You know, and so, okay, and go back to uh, point number one, I didn't know what I wanted to join, so when the recruiter started talking to me, uh, I really didn't know I wanted to join the Army or the Navy, so I kind of have a compromise, I joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> <laughs> and plus they have a nice you know, looking uniform, I figure, you know, girls like it, you know, so it's, it's a bonus, so I, I decided to, uh, to join the Marine Corps and the recruiter say, hey, uh, I know you want to be an officer, but why don't you enlist first, you know, because the uh, you know, prior listed guys makes better officer and I said okay sure so I signed up uh, you know in my senior year of high school 
my original job was a uh, map compiler. Uh, that's uh, somebody who makes maps. But uh, halfway through boot camp, they told me, well, you can't be a map compiler because uh, you're colorblind. So uh, come, come back in uh, week 10, just before you graduate, and we'll, we'll see what your unit has to offer because it's a reserve unit. You can only enlist whatever open slot they have. So uh, week 10, I, by then, of course, you're, you got a little bit of experience. You kind of know what military is all about as opposed to what you watch on, on Saturday morning reruns. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, they told me, uh, well, you got, your unit had three openings. Uh, you can be a maintenance management specialist. I have no idea what that was. Uh, you can be a, a supply clerk. Uh, okay, uh, and or you can be a mortarman. Well, by then I already knew what the 81 millimeter mortar was, and I had no idea I want to carry the plate, so I become, <laughs> so I become a supply warehouseman. And uh, so that's yeah, that's kind of like how I got started uh, in, a, in a military. And eventually, uh, when it's time to uh, look uh, to transition into the officer program, the problem was back then, it was 1993, uh, the storm already happened, and the uh, military was downsizing. So I knew I couldn't uh, get in the Marine Corps uh, officer candidates school because, I mean, they, they, they needed so few people. Uh, but the Army threw me a scholarship, say, hey, if you join the Army, uh, here's your scholarship, and you don't have to drill anymore. And I thought, it sounds like a sweet deal. <laughs> so I joined, you know, I joined the Army, and I always joke about it to a lot of people, said, because the Marine Corps, it's also infamous for slow promotions. I'm sure Chris can attest to that. So uh, my joke is always, that's kind of actually true. Well, I couldn't make corporal in the Marine Corps, so I decided to join the Army because they're going to throw me a commission. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, um, just a quick follow-up, um, Peter. Yes. What, um, what was the reaction of your family when you told them you were joining the military? It's actually ver uh, very, very uh, mixed. Uh, on my immediate family's uh, side, you know, my parents didn't mind because, uh, okay, go back a little bit. We uh, we came from Taiwan. I was born in Taiwan. Uh, we immigrated to the United States when I was 11. And my parents ran a little uh, part of our Photoshop. Those of you who remember films, <laughs> <laughs> film camera. Okay, so anyway, uh, so they, they talked to a lot of customers. They know, see, where we, where we came from in Taiwan, the military is kind of looked down upon. Uh, the, you know, it's like the perception is whether it's true or not is another matter. But the perception is well, you you attend a military academy basically because you couldn't get into real college. Uh, that's the public perception. There's no public support for the military because the military is seen as the the tool the government used to control the, the population. Uh, so, but they you know we they they talk to a lot of their customers. You know they. Uh, it's different in the U.S., so my parents are pretty open to the idea. A little bit of worry, perhaps, uh, especially once they hear it up, well, I want to volunteer for the Marine Corps. Uh, uh, Grandma didn't like it at all. Uh, basically, tell me, don't tell anybody. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Chris? Uh, not to be too long-winded. Um, so, I was in the Marine Corps ROTC in high school. Um, so it kind of uh, it kind of got uh, ingrained into me, uh, you know, going through four years of, of ROTC and having a senior uh, uh, a senior enlisted instructor and then an officer. You get both sides of the picture. But for me, I I really just enjoyed the opportunities. The, the ROTC, you know, super structure gave me lots of education. That, you know, I feel like I cheated. I got to spend four years preparing for boot camp. Um, <laughs> But so I, uh, you know, I, I always, as a kid, I always had animals. I, I loved. I, I, my mom's not here. My my parents are, are, are here. My mom's not here. But uh, uh, I had family come in, and, and I always had kid animals as a kid. And I, I think they would say the same thing. It was always some kind of critter in whatever container I had in my closet or on, on, in my room. But I always knew I wanted to do something with animals. And my my junior and in, in my senior year of high school, we. Uh, uh, you know, I was applying for colleges, and I wanted to be a veterinarian. I, you know, I, I really loved being able just to take care of animals. That's what I wanted to do. 
Um, and I knew, you know, it, it's not something that the military really offers out. And at the time, all I knew about was uh, from videos and you know World War II, especially with the Navy using dolphins and using marine life to plant or find um, uh, underwater mines. Well, the 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 summer before my senior year of high school, we came up to Quantico as a as a ROTC field trip. And we went to Quantico as part of the trip, and we got to see the military working dogs on Quantico. And I think there were 16 or uh, of, of students there, and I was the only one that was old enough. I was 18, and I had just uh, or I think I just turned 17, um, or I was almost about to turn 18. But uh, we came up, and uh, I was the only one that volunteered to to, catch, to put the suit on and catch one of the military working dogs. Um, and of course, this. If I remember correctly, like a 70, 80 pound Belgian Malinois housed me and flipped me over and it was uh, the laugh between the Marines, but I think that kind of opened my eyes, um, you know, that there, you know, there's, there's a, uh, an animal world outside of, you know, just uh, cutting open animals and taking care of them. So I went back to my, my uh, went back and I had already been talking to the Marine recruiter. In fact, uh, I was eligible that November to dip into the, uh, dip into the military. Or uh, to join the join join the military, and so I went and uh, saw my recruiter, and uh, I went and saw the army recruiter at first to you know to, to reach out about the vet tech, and um, you know pretty much flat out told me there's no way. You know the army at the time I think was everybody was open contract. There was no choosing your choosing your billets. So I had gone over to the Marine Corps recruiter, and 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 uh, Sergeant Jordan was his name, and I asked him, hey, can I be a dog handler? I was like, since I can't be a vet tech and the army's not really offering that, can I be a dog handler? And he told me, no. He said, but if you've got the grades, you've got the ASVAB score, you've got the wheel on the drive, you've got a little bit of the background, um, becoming a military police officer, if you can get top 5% of your class and you can win a board, you can become a dog handler. So, you know, I, I signed up, you know, and decked in, um, I think, really quickly in November of 2000 or 1999. And uh, my mom, not too keen on it. In fact, she called my recruiter. Um, the rec original recruiter I talked to was sergeant, um, was a sergeant. And my mom called him up, and said he's not going. This is not happening. Um, <laughs> that, the, I think within a month or so, that recruiter had uh, had uh, PCS'd out, and Sergeant Jordan came in. And I think he, uh, whatever he said to my mom, kind of eased her mind. Um, I don't really remember my my dad or or, or, or uh, anyone else's, uh, you know. Uh, they're accepting of it. I don't remember. Even if they had, I probably wasn't listening. I was. I'm pretty strong-willed. I'm not gonna really listen to. I've got my mind set on something. That's what I'm gonna do. But it really came down to just. I, you know, it had to be animals, and, and I loved what the Marine Corps had to offer. And the uniforms aren't bad. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I joined knowing that you know I, I wanted to be a Marine. And I loved what the Marine Corps had to offer, and the dog handler was just kind of that goal to set myself for. So. You know, I decked in, uh, went to boot camp in August 2000. Um, uh, when I was in boot camp, the USS Cole was bombed. Um, so it kind of opened up my, my world to, you know, it's not just a job. And I think that was my first introduction because my mom had told me, like, you're going to go to war. You know, you're, you're going to get killed. You're, you know, and I think that was kind of her, her biggest fear was just losing her, her baby boy to, to, to combat. Um, and I never, I don't ever remember thinking about it. I don't ever remember, you know, worrying about combat or worrying about going to war at the time that, you know, there was, there wasn't really anything. It was, you know, um, you know, there was no Cold War fears that, you know, uh, uh, terrorism wasn't necessarily a thing, but in November of 2000, when the coal got bombed, it all became reality. And our drill instructors all sat, you know, sat us down. I think it was uh, both our drill instructors and our seniors said, we will be going to war soon. So just so everybody knows, you know, there's no, if you, you know, if you can't handle it, and it was, uh, you know, a week or a month and a half or so into boot camp. So we were we were all pretty much committed by this point. But that was my first introduction to it. But just like the other gentleman said, communication, you know, then what probably is much, much better than it is now. But, you know, I, I stood in the line at the pay phone, the same thing I called, no answer. So I just hung up and went back my thing. And I think about uh, uh, Two or three weeks after, or before boot camp, or before we get ready to graduate, I got called into the yeah. senior drill instructor office. I had to go get escorted to the first sergeant because I hadn't talked to my mom, and she was worried to death. So I got to, I had to make a phone call to my mom at the the, the company first sergeant's desk. You know, quick and brief. I'm alive. I'm eating well. Three three square meals a day. Not working me too hard. Um, and I got a bunch of little boot camp stories. That I'm sure that these gentlemen do as well. But you know, when I. Um, 
communication, you know, I, I think my family was really on board. I do remember, and this is the story I love telling, is my dad, and I, I kind of took it, it, it with a grain of salt. My dad, the day I left for boot camp, gave me a hug. And I don't remember exactly what I said, but I took it as he said, I'll see you in a couple weeks. It was like I wasn't going to make it. So I kind of I kind of took that. I think he just didn't know how long boot camp was, or he just simplified I'll see you soon. Um, but I remember uh, taking that and saying, like, well, I'm, I'm a small, I was a small kid then, you know, I was still going through puberty in boot camp. And, uh, you know, I was really, really small. I started to grow a little bit towards the end. Um, but, uh, you know, I took it as, you know, I might be small and I might be, it might be little, but I know I can do just as good. Um, and I went into it, you know, I want to be, a, I want to be, a, I want to be the, you know, the squad leader. Which is not don't don't go to boot camp with that mentality. You trust me, you'll set yourself up for all, fail for failure. But uh, it really came down to you know I, I think my family was on board. I had uh, two cousins. Um, one had joined the navy. One joined the army. They were uh, I think a year older than me, so they they had were had, you know um, had gone through boot camp. Were kind of were there, but you know no marines. My grandfather uh, got a purple heart in the Korean War. My dad's my dad's father I think he had two or three purple hearts. Um, and he was a, a, drill, a drill instructor or a drill sergeant for the army uh, during the post Korean War. And, uh, you know, I, I, I loved what the military had to offer. Um, and the, you can't beat the camaraderie. Uh, I think I answered it all. Yes, excuse me. Very good. Thank you. Um, our next question is going to move a little bit further along in your military careers. Um, this is when you were deployed, and certainly during your deployment. Um, you've kind of somewhat gone over a little bit of this, but. How often did you communicate with family members back home? What stresses did you have when you were communicating with family members? I know in previous panels dealing with this subject, um, it seems like the person that's deployed often doesn't want to let their family members know exactly what's going on with them, and the family members do want to know what's going on with them. You know, so how did you how did you evaluate what you needed to say to them to reduce the stresses both for you and for your loved ones back home? And with that, I'll start with Peter. Okay, well, I guess I don't have to uh, compare different deployments because it was different. Uh, so my first uh, wartime deployment, uh, first time it was uh, Iraq in 2003. Uh, by, I command a, what are they called, Trans Station Corps uh, Movement Control Team. So it's just a very small cell of, uh, I guess the best way I can explain it is the word like the planner, the, the administrator of uh, Trans Station. And so it's just a very small team attached to uh, First Cavalry Division's uh, headquarters. And my second one, uh, I was actually uh, the battalion executive officer for this type of unit in Afghanistan. And the third time, uh, and the second one was 2008, 2009. Third time uh, was 2012. Uh, I, at that point, I was uh, 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 executive officer for uh, the advisor team that's uh, working directly with the Afghan National Army, our mission the third time was to train the Afghans. So the geography and the setup is a little bit different, and so it did, and also technology changed. That's why uh, it did affect uh, quite a bit on how we communicate. Because the first time uh, we went into Iraq, uh, yeah, we're not the, the first wave that went in and liberated the country, but we're not like the people who relieved them. So there wasn't a whole lot of infrastructure there uh, at the time. So the, really the only time, uh, the only way I can, uh, Talk to my uh, wife uh, real time was they set up these uh, internet ca uh, cafes and we were just on instant messenger because there was no uh, there's not enough weight room for like Skype or anything like that back in 2003 and I remember at one time they, they used to set up uh, I mean now they can just do this uh, through Skype in your own, own room but back then uh, you had to go uh, like my wife would have to travel to Fort Hood those family inside the first cavalry division headquarters they would set up these, it's like a VTC uh, setup, and we have something like that on our end, but uh, I actually, uh, it was set up by, for, by my uh, battalion, which is, it's a not on, uh, we call it back, uh, by, uh, Baghdad International Airport, which is the first cast headquarter, because my, I'm kind of like detached from my battalion, so my battalion's at another location, so in order to get to the place where I could talk to my wife, I had to, get on a helicopter and, uh, and you know you wait a few hours uh, so it's not like a really easy travel process so I remember what happened was so I got to uh, Balad Air Base 
where my battalion was at, and I was supposed and well, the whole Clifford's little trip was so I could talk to my wife, right? And then they they sounded this alarm, you know, they had this giant air raid alarm every time uh, you get uh, indirect fire from the Iraqis, they'll sound the alarm and it, it won't have a whole clear for two, three hours. <laughs> and it, it's kind of dumb because uh, what they are is their harassment. The Iraqis knew we have uh, counter battery fire radar so they don't stick around. They had these uh, homemade uh, rocket launchers or mortar launchers. They, they're re either remote uh, fired or they're on a timer. So uh, you know we, that's why we can never find these guys. Uh, and it doesn't help in say Air Force. They say, oh, we sent out an F-16, but we can't find it. It's like, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> uh, anyway, so go back to what I was talking about. So they, well, I was supposed to go up to a VTC, talk to my wife, and they sound this air raid alarm. And I'm like, oh, great. So my whole purpose, my whole trip is now in jeopardy, and you're supposed to seek cover. So I'm like, uh, no. So I basically, you know, hide from building to building, made my way up to the, uh, the the building where I was supposed to be at, you know, where the VTC was supposed to be at. And so I walk in, and this soldier guy looked at me and said, sir, did you know uh, we were in lockdown? You know, we had the incoming fire. You're supposed to say, take, you know, put shelter in place. Oh, really? Uh, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and that's how I was able to talk to my wife, you know, so it was a little bit harder uh, because of technology uh, at the time, so you, you actually got to go through that much trouble just to, you know, to see and hear uh, your loved one uh, real time. But of course, you know, compared to previous generation, this is pretty good stuff. But the next deployment, it was a lot easier because uh, as a battalion XO, I have um, those of you who are in the military, you know what a DSN line is. DOD had its own uh, phone network, and because I was XO, I have a DSN line in my office, so it was pretty easy. All I had to do was pick out the phone and uh, call for the, the operator to connect and make a call, so that was relatively easy. Except one night, uh, we got another uh, uh, rocket attack, so we're supposed to be down, uh, downstairs and because the we we were it's our buildings an old soviet building left over uh from, from the soviet afghan war in the 80s and these buildings uh, it's not like they have hard roof it's it's just this corrugated uh i mean it's a hard building but it's corrugated still with uh two by fours holding it up so uh you're supposed to seek shelter like on the first floor but you know when they sound the alarm i didn't want my wife to get worried because we're in the middle of a phone call so and I've been through this before, so I just grabbed my helmet, put on my flight jacket, and I sit in my office, and I kept popping <laughs> and until we're done, basically. Uh, so, uh, and the third time, it was actually the easiest uh, because uh, I was an advisor uh, working with the Afghan army. What the, what they did is we, we have our own camp within the Afghan ar uh, uh, army base, and that camp is for uh, coalition, uh, we call it ISAF, International uh, Stabilization uh, Force. And it's ISAF personnel only, and it's basically U.S., NATO, and a few other countries. So if you're if you're not ISAF, and if you're Afghan, you have to be invited to come inside our, our camp. And uh, by this time, the technology is so good. Hey, you know, we have our own internet connection in our own room. So it was like living in luxury. <laughs> it's like hard building, indoor plumbing. Uh, it's, you know, which is very nice. And one thing I did not expect, now this is not communication at home, but it is an evolution of communication on a battlefield. Uh, one day I was off work and I was sitting in my room on Facebook. I have a friend who was a contractor at Kabul, downtown Kabul, and he posted we're under attack. And that was the first time in my career I found out we we're under attack through Facebook. <laughs> yeah, because I saw it, I couldn't believe it. I picked out the phone uh, and, and I called the uh, our, our front gate, the Canadians who were running the operations center, and said, Hey, uh, I, I just heard news on Facebook, we're under attack, is that true? And they said, Yes, uh, there's an attack in Kabul, so we're in lockdown right now. So that was kind of interesting that you would find out you're under attack through Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, so I I, I, th I consider myself lucky that I got to see the progression, just like Peter said. I uh, I got to Iraq the first time in uh, March of 2003, and I went to Iraq the third time in uh, March 2008, and then I went to Afghanistan in 2011 and 2012, 2010, 2011. So I got to see the progression, just like he said. Uh, I got to. Uh, 
Korean Village was the name of the town when I when I uh, first got to Iraq in the beginning of 2003. It was the expansion uh, plan. We everything was pretty much centered around Baghdad and Fallujah at the time. And and uh, when OIF2 kicked off in March, um, and then our our uh, battalion or when our our deployment went, um, we were all starting you know new fobs all over. And I was my first one. I was uh, stuck out west in Al Anbar province, right next to I was actually the kennel master in control of the borders between Syria and Lebanon. And we lived in our, just lived in our, there was no, there was nothing. There was no, there was no contact, there was no phones, there was no cell phones. We had uh, nipper net, or zipper net, and that was it. We had, you could go to the talk, and then at one point we ended up getting a, um, a Iridium phone. Okay. Yeah, so we were able to use, uh, you know, satellite phones, but it was, you know, we only had so many hours that they allotted for us, and it was almost always at like two and three o'clock in the morning. Um, and then you fast forward, uh, you know, to my second deployment, 2007, and you actually had, you know, um, the the they were called the um, the morale building. Oh, the MWR. Yeah, the MWRs. Yeah. So we had they had actually had by this point you actually had morale uh, uh, morale welfare and, and recreation Rich. buildings where they had actually had a government contract to build and provide these outlets for, for for the veterans for the guys deployed. You know, when it first started out, you had, you know, phones and you had internet, and back then it was AI, we were using AIM and Messenger, or we were using uh, Yahoo Messenger before Facebook and all that came out, but, uh, before it was eligible for, uh, for everybody, but, you know, and then you fast forward to, you know, my deployment in Afghanistan, um, where you could get, you know, if everybody, you had a, a group of guys living in consolidated housing units together, you all pull your money and you could literally order internet provider you can order a satellite for your building and you all share and it was, it was the the changes between 2004 and 2003 2004 and 2012 were, were you know were widespread and and I do remember um, and my wife and I uh, you know we were able to talk through you know through Facebook and through Yahoo Yahoo Messenger or excuse me through uh, AIM and through Yahoo Messenger and, and, and that was that was your communication but I specifically remember my first appointment you're writing letters, you know, thinking back to you know, guys in Civil War, Vietnam, World War II, that was their communi mode of communication. And, you know, I think uh, if you were east or near Baghdad or, or Fallujah, you probably had a better, uh, which I did learn later on, you had a better better opportunity for communication. But early on, your, your guys were cut off um, for months on end. And if it weren't for tons and tons of downtime and tons and tons of, uh, you know, uh, freedom, which was probably the biggest killer for, for, for myself and for, for everybody else was just trying to fill that time. You know, write you know, write your unborn daughter, you know, a letter every week, just, you know, hey, this is what's going on with me, just in case I don't make it, you'll know at least a little bit about me. Um, you're doing things like that, you know, that was that was about it uh, early on. But you know, you fast forward to, to 2010, 2011, where it's nothing to just you know, walk across the other side of the fob, you know, get in line, put your name on the list and hop on the phone and you've got a clear connection like they're in, you know, they're across the state versus, uh, you know, it sounds like they're 100 million miles away and you have to speak and you have to wait five seconds for the relay to get across, get back to you. Um, you know, that could be a little bit of challenging, but, you know, that communication is is the challenging part. Even just you know, like, uh, like John and, and uh, Peter were both saying, your family not knowing where it is uh, or where you are is difficult. So, you know, we, we, come, we, we get cheap. So, oh, did you see this on the news? Or, you know, luckily, AFN was available. So, we were able to kind of get a grasp of what was going on in the world. Um, but, excuse me, it really came down to operational security. You know, we wanted you guys to know, but we can only tell you so much without, you know, fear of the, the, the enemy. Oh, so wait, I, I actually forgot something. Eventually, sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> cell phones, local cell phones become available as war progress. Yeah. They, they start standing up local uh, cell phone companies, so soldiers start, if your area gets a signal, they, they start buying it, so they kind of work both ways. Yeah, yeah go ahead. and yeah, especially towards the, I'm sure after, and I remember Afghanistan, when we were able to actually get buy cell phones, it was like one of the first things, we all hit Kabul and hit uh, UAE, and we're like, I need a cell phone. Uh, problem is getting service for, so we had, you know, there were times we had, uh, you had guys on top of the shoes with, aluminum foil in their phones or when, you know, people are buying oh I've got this this disc that, that connects to your battery and you put it on an antenna you attach it to the building and it turns your whole building to an antenna they don't work but you know and, and like I said it goes back to that and having that free downtime when well, my cell phone doesn't work I'm gonna map every square inch of this fob just to make sure 
Uh, and sometimes you'll find a corner, like on Tuesdays, <laughs> you get half a bar in. Uh, but communication, you know, I definitely, uh, you know, Facebook was a, a, a big in, in my Afghanistan deployment with being able to communicate with the world. But unfortunately, we see challenges with, uh, you know, these soldiers, these, these Marines, these veterans, these active duty service members getting in trouble, just, you know, trying to, you know, not necessarily trying to be slick, but trying to relay to, to people back home, that, hey, I'm good, I'm, you know, okay. And, and just like I said with my boot camp story, same thing happened to me in Japan. I get to I get to Okinawa, my first first duty station, and about a month in, I get called up to the provost marshal's office. Call your mom. So I do apologize to my mom and my family. I probably was uh, probably driving them crazy back at home, but it really come uh, you know getting the mission done over there. And you know as much downtime as we had, you know. Uh, Sometimes, you know, just being able to sit in your chew and sit in the dark, you know, especially if you have AC, you have quiet time and not everything's blowing up or dogs barking, all that stuff that's going on. It's, you know, we, we want to be able to communicate, but, you know, I, I love writing letters. I, I still think back, I wish I had my later deployments, I wish I had continued to write letters because I know my spouse, my kids still have a couple of those letters and, you know, reading back on them, I, thinking of my mindset then was uh, totally different. And I, 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 luckily it did destroy all the, the letters that were like, if you're reading this, I'm probably gone or whatever. And so, you know, just go, going through that mentality of reading that mindset, I wish I had kept some of that stuff to be able to, to pass on. And I think I, I think I still have some stuff that I think you guys would be interested in. Thank you. Um, John. Uh, well, I kind of predate all this. Um, <laughs> uh, in a communication void back in yes, the in, in, Indeed. Uh, funny story. I. I mentioned that when I enlisted um, and I was in Fort Knox, Kentucky, and I said, they told me they don't have communication or public information officers, and I said, well, you have them, how do you become one? And he said, you go to infantry officers candidate school and request a branch transfer. Uh, I said, what are the odds of that happening? He said, none. <laughs> <laughs> so I chose not to do that. but. Um, Everybody that was, I was, uh, before I was deployed, I was at Fort uh, Lee, Virginia, and we all knew we were going to Vietnam, it was, that's what, where we were going. And um, I tried to prepare my family for that. Um, it still came, I think, a, a little bit of a surprise when you get the orders and you realize that you're supposed to show up at, uh, uh, in, uh, in Washington at Fort uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, on such and such a date to deploy to um, Da Nang, and you uh, are assigned to this 13th Signal Battalion of the First Air Cavalry Division. Wondering what in the world that's all about. Um, but uh, as I said, it was there was there was no way to communicate other than by letter uh, except in the rare rare instances where you could get to a telephone and they, there wasn't a lot of them in Vietnam there was no there was no way to communicate and um, during the Tet Offensive in 1968 um, we were deployed uh, to uh, an area outside of Quezon called LZ Landing Zone Stud and um, I was injured there in the same incident that uh, you may remember Jimmy Carter having named Max Cleland to head the Veterans Administration um, as a triple amputee. Max and I were injured in the same incident and um, so quite a period of time goes by and there's no way for me to communicate with my family. Um, I wrote a letter, um, I don't think it ever got delivered. Um, ultimately, the Red Cross um, communicated with my folks and told them that I had been injured, but that they didn't have any more information than that. And my dad went into overdrive and uh, wanted to find out what was going on, and there just wasn't any way for anybody to know. I'm moving around from hospital to hospital from, um, and about the time a message gets here, well, I'm two places away from that and I'm not there anymore. Um, I do recall being in, uh, at a, a hospital in Tansanuk and um, I was able to place a telephone call to my wife 
Uh, she had, she knew that I'd been injured, didn't have any other information. And I called her and I, I mean, I called her whatever I could get on the phone. It happened to be like three o'clock in the morning back in the States. Uh, she freaked out because the phone rang in the middle of the night and then the found out it was me. But you couldn't have a conversation with her. I'm talking to a ham radio operator in Hawaii who has made a telephone call to some other place in the States that made another connection to our home in Michigan. And so I'm saying, I'm okay, over. <laughs> and then there's this long delay, and then she gets the message, and she said, where are you? And I start to answer, and the operator comes on and says, you're not allowed to provide that information. <laughs> so there was all these security issues, so you couldn't tell anybody where you were, but they, they found out that I was alive. And I eventually ended up um, at, a, uh, uh, at a hospital in Japan, and that's when I could really, I could finally have uh, a broader telephone call. Um, it's interesting because I'm not sure, I, I know that for them um, it must have been extremely um, frantic to think that your son, your husband is injured, you don't know where he is, you don't know what, how he is, you don't know what's going on. Um, and yet for me it was almost um, more comforting for them not to have all the details of that because if it was today uh, someone had been doing a, a selfie of the operation in the match or something and so I think that it was kind of easier for the, on me for them not to have not to be exposed to everything that was going on until there was an opportunity for everybody to kind of settle down a little bit and know that everything was all right. Well, thank you. Um, moving on towards the end of your military service or your careers, um, this is how did you learn that your that your um, deployments or you were leaving the military? How did um, especially coming out of a war zone? Um, how did you learn about your leaving the war zone, returning back to the states? And when your military service ended, could you tell a little bit about your transition to civilian life for both you and your loved ones and your family on the home side? And I'll, I'll start that one first with Chris. So, um, like I said, my, uh, you know, my career, I did eight years, five months, and 11 days, uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the last change of five months really came uh, you know uh, being forced into forced into another deployment um, but uh, for me it really came down to you know at the time I had uh, after my uh, my when I finished my first deployment I was actually uh, uh, my daughter my oldest daughter was due um, on uh, like December 2nd and I left I left the country uh, flew from from Al-Assad Iraq to uh, uh, um, Seville, Spain, uh, and then when we stopped in Spain, we were able finally because we were able to call a little bit from from the air from Al Assad. But we get to uh, we get to uh, get to Spain. We're able to make a uh, we're able to make phone calls. But you know, I knew my daughter was going to be uh, due, and I kind of wanted to kind of wanted to surprise the family. So uh, we had like a six hour layover, and then we go to take off from Seville. And we we take if anybody's been to, to the, the coast of, uh, of Spain, it's beautiful. You literally fly off right off the cliffs, right into the ocean. So we took off, flew. I think we maybe flew 15, 30 minutes, and one of our engines caught fire of the Air Force. Um, so we had to turn around and go back. We got stuck there about 18 hours. And in that time, um, my oldest daughter was born, um, and I, I, I kept. Uh, so we finally got to, got a new plane or got the engine fixed. We took off, and I landed in uh, Camp, landed in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And uh, the first thing, you know, when I got picked up from my unit was, oh, congratulations, you've got a, a daughter. You know, and I didn't know this at the time. I was like, oh, well, thank I missed it. She's not due for that week. Um, but I got, you know, it was the, the separation, being able to surprise was, 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 was interesting. But it led into, you know, uh, my second and my third deployment with, with, uh, as an active duty Marine. Where it's hey you've got you've got nine months left we need to deploy you for we need to deploy you for seven of those but you have to have ninety days when you get back so we're gonna have to extend you for five months to squeeze another deployment out of you and I think that was 
pretty much the final straw for me. Um, when I uh, when I was finishing up that uh, when I finished up that last deployment, I came back and my daughter. The first thing she said, because she was uh, I think five at the time, and she said, uh, "You're not leaving again, right?" And I think I didn't think about it up until that point, you know. And I think right then and there, I was like, "No, I'm, I'm definitely not going to be deployed." Um, little did I know that uh, the money is really really good when you're outside the military. But uh, you know the, uh, to, you know when I when I was uh, when I was offered that that opportunity to reenlist, and um, you know it really came down to my, you know. I, I, my daughter's, my oldest daughter's five years old, and I've been deployed for, you know, give or take three, three and a half years. I've either been gone TED preparing for deployment or coming back. So the, I think the decision was, the decision was pretty easy for me, um, and I got offered a really good job uh, doing the exact same thing, just with less pain. Um, but it really came down to, you know, just, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say I felt like I had given enough, but I knew, you know, I'd rolled the dice enough times that, you know, you know, and at this point, when I was when I was finishing my third, that was you know unheard of. You know, this is in 2000, 2008, You know, where you know most people were still trying to get their first deployment, or were just coming back their first. And being a dog handler, we were getting pumped out, especially being the combat dogs. You know, we were getting sent back. Uh, you know, so I went three summers in a row, and it, you know, the joke for me became. You know, I keep missing baseball seasons. I love the Braves. And, you know, you guys maybe missed three seasons in a row. Um, I was like, I haven't seen a baseball game in three years. I've been deployed for the entire season. So, um, you know, but the pull came back, you know, and, and I always get asked, you know, if I missed the Marine Corps. And my answer still is no, I don't necessarily miss the Marine Corps. What I missed were Marines. Um, so when I was given the opportunity to, to you know, to deploy again, um, a little bit better pay, a little less danger. Um, but and, and at this point, there's tons of uh, communication with, 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 uh, with family back home. It became much easier. Um, so the decision was wasn't so hard, but my oldest daughter, you know, was not not keen on it, and still I remember me saying I wouldn't deploy again. I'm like, this isn't a deployment, this is a contract. So I was able to kind of finagle that, but you know, that's that was it for me. I couldn't do any more, um, and, and I still regret. I loved what I did, but uh, you know, unfortunately um, for for my job, you know, I got promoted out of it. Once you pick up E6, you're pretty much that's it. You know, you're. You know, you get to a kennel master slot, and you're probably going to be uh, stationed in a base. You're not going anywhere. You're going to be stuck here for you know, you know, forever, pretty much. And then once you pick up E7, you're, that's it. You're definitely done. So when I picked up the E6, um, you know, at the end of 2008, you know, I knew my number uh, was 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 pretty much it, and they wanted me to take another team out again. And it really came down to, you know, I just I knew I had rolled the dice. A few too many times and gotten really, really lucky, and you know, saw people that did not get lucky, and guys that were dying to deploy and just couldn't get the spot. So uh, you know, I was like, well, let me let the young guys do their thing, and, and uh, it was a smart decision, I think. But uh, what was the second end of the question? Um, your transition. How how was the transition to civilian life for both you and your family? So I got out in January of 2009. Um, I had planned prior to my last deployment. I did all my transition assistance. I did everything prior to because I knew when I get back I had less than 90 days and it turned out I got back and I had 72 days left to, to completely check out of the Marine Corps and um, I PCS'd my family back here um, I was uh, you know I did my last Marine Corps brawl in November of 2008 um, you know and, and, and I knew I really had no clue what I was going to do um, I knew I you know I had to do, do come, you know contracting it open up for dog handlers and, you know and it was a good good gig it was a little bit safer um, depending but uh, you know to me it was uh, you know once I got out you know I had that job um, you know and I did that job for a little bit and then they uh, they canceled the the, the, the contract so I kind of was in limbo. I'd been out of the Marine Corps for about 120 days, and I, uh, my dad, luckily enough, took me on as electrician's apprentice for a couple of months, but totally not an electrician. Um, uh, but it just led me to, to write back in. Uh, hence, the, when we named uh, when we named our nonprofit Simmer Canine, it really came from a joke. One of my my Marine handlers, you know, reached out to me and said, uh, you know, uh, I had just finished my master's degree, and I'm trying to you know trying to find something to do with veterans. 
you know, are you are you still doing the dog thing? And I thought it was a joke. You know, I was like, I always be canine. I was like, I, you know, I tried, I tried to do the, the, the safe, easy gig. You know, the or no offense to my dad, but the, you know, the 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 the, the workman's thing. You know, just you know, get, get on, going to work and you know, leave that at home and you get to, or leave that at work and you can come home. And you know, it, the, the, I love dogs too. Uh, and I got, you know, I kind of got stuck back into it, and um, you know, so that that to me made it the transition really easy because I knew, you know, even if I had to go do a job, I mean, I've got that battle buddy with me, I've got someone to do it with. Um, I know it was really hard on my family, you know, and, and unfortunately, you know, it, it, it caused the end of that marriage, um, you know, just just. The separation, you know, and I, I, I'm sure my family who dealt with me, uh, who luckily put me up after after that divorce, um, you know, and, and tried to, and saw me, you know, probably go through some some tough times uh, for a good six months there. I looked like a homeless person. I'm sure they remember big old beard and big old mop ahead and played video games all day and didn't want to go outside, chain smoking cigarettes and just uh, just trying to survive day to day. And uh, I know I know it put a put a toll on them. And, but luckily, you know, having that network, having that support group, uh, I was able to, you know, come out of my shell. I was able to, to you know, uh, rekindle, you know, an old relationship with, uh, you know, um, with someone who, who I had always stayed in touch with, and and I definitely can't thank my family enough for, for the support. You know, that, uh, you know, I know it's taking in a 30-year-old, you know, son that can't seem to take care of himself. You know, can be, can be tough, but. Uh, you know, they, they were there for me. My my my, uh, my wife, um, uh, you know, broke me out of that shell and, and gave me a goal. And I, and I found out that it really came down to what do you want to do when you're 60? What do you want to do? When, you know, do you want to retire? Or do you want to do something for the next 20 years and retire? Or do you want to be able to pass on something to somebody? And I think that's what I took as. You know, I, the Marine Corps taught me a ton. You know, the transition was difficult, but I can teach others. I can pass it on. I can make. You know, I, I steal Edison here. Uh, uh, as, excuse me. I steal. Uh, uh, I just I brain fart is the, the scientist uh, Darwin. Uh, I, I steal from. No, it's different. No. Anyways, I, I'll steal from a great, and I say this, uh, you know, if I've seen farther than, than most, because I stood on the shoulder of giants, and, you know, I definitely commend the Marine Corps. I could not do this if it weren't for the Marine Corps, everything they taught me. Um, you know, they, they, the transitions, I get to work with, I get to work with guys, again, in the military now, and I know the military has done, a, done tremendous amounts um, since when I got out, you know, and the guys that were getting out with me, to guys getting out now, there is that continuation care. Uh, you know, I commend, I commend our government, I commend our military for, for, for noticing those challenges that need to be met. Um, and I know for a fact that, you know, the veterans coming out now probably have way more support, way more, um, that community involvement that, that these gentlemen probably had to, probably had to deal with, and I know I know um, uh, John on the end probably had to deal with a lot coming back. And, you know, and, and I, I love the, the the perception that the community has, and we've gotten we've gotten behind our military much much more than than the mission they they had to accomplish over there. You know, it's still Americans; they're still coming back. They still got their things to deal with, but. You know, community involvement. You know, I cannot be, you know, more happy um, and, and more promoting to that. I, hope, uh, I, I really hope that continues. I hope those, those guys still get that same gear. Thank you, Chris. Um, John. Um, well, uh, when I uh, came back from Vietnam, I was uh, stationed at a subpost of Fort Ord for a short period of time. That's where our daughter was born, and. Um, and then um, I was transferred to Florida, and that's where I finished my, my tour. Uh, and I was running a training records division at Fort Ord at that time. It was a huge basic training uh, facility. We were running classes 24 hours a day. Uh, Vietnam was still hot and heavy and going on, and, and it was like a factory. Um, and. Uh, I, uh, I was fortunate in that uh, the results of my injury um, were, not, uh, were not such that I, uh, I, I wasn't able to function or anything. Um, I know that Max Cleland thought for years that uh, the grenade that 
that detonated was one that had fallen off his belt, and that's he went through 20 some odd years thinking that until it was confirmed that that wasn't the case. Um, he made a point of saying, you know, I guess I feel better about the Purple Heart now, but <laughs> um, I'm still mad at whoever threw it. And, uh, you know, I, the, the Purple Heart is nice, but I wish it hadn't happened. Um, the, the, um, when I realized, I mean, my situation was different. I had enlisted for three years, and I knew that on the 4th of August of 1970, I was done. And um, I had had an opportunity, I'd been in, in uh, communications, I'd been in newspapers before I was in the Army, and so uh, I didn't think I wanted anything to do with that, um, because the job I had at our local newspaper selling advertising before I went in the Army paid $65 a week, and um, I thought that this industry is too cheap, I don't want to do that. And uh, what, in the end, what happened was, uh, this is 1970, jobs were hard to find. I happened to be back in Michigan about six months before I got out of the Army, and a friend of mine was working for a larger newspaper in Detroit, and he said, you ought to come down and talk to these people. I did, they offered me a job, and he said, I'll keep the job open until uh, July. You get out in August. and." you tell me by July whether or not you want to come to work here. And so I had spent that time looking and couldn't find anything, and so I thought, well, okay, I'm, I'm in California, but I'll go back to Michigan. And they offered me a job making $200 a week. And I'd been making, I was a staff sergeant, E6, and I was making $369 a month. And I thought, Whoa, 200 bucks a week? This is unbelievable. And we got paid every week. I used, was used to get paid once a month. I knew it, you know, Thursday would come and I hadn't cashed last week's paycheck. Yeah. So uh, I thought I was in pretty high cotton and I thought, you know, $10,000 a year. If you ever got to the point where you could make fifteen or $20,000 a year, who would never need more money than that? Um, so my transition from military life to, um, to um, a private citizen was uh, pretty seamless. I mean, I got out on, I don't remember what day of the week it was, but whatever August 4th was of 1970, by the Monday of the next week, I was at work at this newspaper in, in downtown Detroit. And, you know, I'm uh, still only 26. I'm uh, full of vinegar and and uh, other bodily fluids, and I'm thinking, this is what I want to do. I'm going to make a name for myself here. And so it was suddenly I went from kind of a slow pace, winding down of a career in, in the military to, you know, full steam ahead in a private situation. Um, I think the, the issue that impacted me as I think back on it now, uh, I too ended up uh, getting divorced after a fairly long marriage, and I think that in some measure um, that was uh, a result of feeling like um, I had to keep a lot of these things that had happened kind of inside. Um, uh, they were issues I had to deal with, I didn't need to deal, I didn't need anybody else to feel like they had to help deal with them. Um, uh, like Chris, I was fortunate um, to find Lori, who's in the audience here, um, and she will often say, how come I am the one who you learned to talk back to? <laughs> uh, uh, because I, I realized that in some measure that probably was uh, part of what uh, caused uh, my divorce, although my first wife and I are still friends and still in a relationship, but um, I, I kind of look back now and um, the military was something that I'm not, I, I, I wouldn't do, I'm glad I did it, I'm glad I was there. If I'd known all this, would I raise my hand and sign up for it again? I'm not so sure I would have, but uh, I do think it affected me. One of the, the great lessons that I took out of the military um, was that the Army is such a huge organization and the bureaucracy is so pervasive 
Uh, I have two brothers, both of whom have worked for themselves because they weren't able to work for anybody else. Yep. Um, I, um, I w have never done that until the stuff I'm doing now on my own, but I've always worked for larger newspaper co corporations. And I think one of the things that the military taught me was how to get along in this gigantic bureaucracy. I think back about basic training and the, and the guy that's arguing about the fact that he is not going to wax the springs under his bunk. <laughs> well, he, he's going to wax the springs under the bunk. He can either do it at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when everybody else is, or you can do it at 3 o'clock in the morning, but you're going to do it. And so this whole idea of, okay, I, I can figure out how to operate within the larger of bureaucracy, and I think that that's what helped me uh, in my civilian career after the Army was the ability that, okay, there's some things you can change, there's some things you can't. Find a way to deal with what you need, what you think you need to, to do within that bureaucracy. Thank you, John. Um, last one, Peter. Well, uh, I actually got out of the Army twice, and <laughs> I will come back to that a little bit, because basically, the thing is, everybody likes to talk about PTSD these days. The Something else that's just as bad is uh, what I call operational stress, uh, just being around the military, it's especially in this kind of wartime environment we're in. Uh, just that create a lot of stress. Uh, so give you an example of why I got out of the Army twice. The second time was when I done my 20 years and I retired for good. The first time was uh, right after I came back from Iraq. And uh, I mean, of course, I kind of decided I wanted uh, on a career officer from day one, but the uh, the reason I took it on expected leave was, well, after I came back from Iraq, um, I basically was, I have a choice, uh, I can be separated for two years, uh, or I can be separated for three years, because I just spent a year in Iraq, right? And, well, the, the thing is, what the, the problem is the military has a, on, especially on the average side, we have a very rigid uh, career development uh, timeline. So by that time, it's like, well, uh, young captain, it's your time to go to Canadian General Staff College. And, well, why, so why does that create a problem? Well, because my wife, um, you know, we're young, so she she needed one more year to finish her, uh, her bachelor's degree. And, you know, she's been going to school and here and there, and whatever is possible. Uh, because before we were in Germany, so, you know, it's not always possible to be a full-time student because of my, my career. and. So here, here's the problem. So if I, so I come back from Iraq, if I were to uh, go to Command General Staff College, then she's going to have to start over and, you know, because she's trying to finish. And then if I say, no, I want to wait, uh, well, we were so desperate back then, they would have maybe take command of another team and turn around and go right back to Iraq. <laughs> so, uh, you know, basically either way, it, it was not a, uh, Desire, really a desirable uh, situation. So uh, in the end, I decided. Well, you know, it, 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 it was like, well, I mean, obviously, I decided on this before I came back from Iraq. So uh, I decided to uh, to get out. And uh, but of course, I had too much time invested by that point. I had ten year, ten and a half years in the military. So I, when I got out, I worked for uh, DHL, the uh, shipping company. Because uh, you know, it's more kind of, kind of like in line of what I was doing in, 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 in military. Uh, but I was in the National Guard, of course, so it, it's quite a bit of work because, you know, in the end, uh, it's like, well, uh, well, first of all, I work, I work, you know, when you, when you work in that industry, you work uh, weird hours, so I work second shift. And my wife, uh, Eventually, after she got her degree, she was working uh, for J.P. Morgan Chase. So she and I would have we a different clock, okay? And uh, and then the thing that was kind of challenging is I would wake up in the morning and say, well, I have a few hours before I go to work, so uh, I can do my homework for the Army's Command General Staff College, because I still have to go to Command General Staff College, even though I was a National Guardsman. And uh, you have homework, so I can do, it was kind of like, Think of it as a working on a master degree online, basically, that's how much time it takes. So I can work on my homework, or I can go PT to exercise because I'm supposed to stay in shape, you know, and 
uh, go run once a year and not die from a heart attack, right? So, <laughs> and, anyway, so my schedule re basically revolved around work, doing homework and PT, and uh, and after a while I realized, oh, well, really the most enjoyable part of my time is to drill, is, you know, uh, uh, doing something I'm kind of used to. And also, one thing that kind of made me want to go back to the military was uh, the industry I worked in. Uh, we, even though I, I was in management, I'm not union, but it's uh, we kind of have a mentality. It works on seniority. So if you cut in front of a line, you have to go ahead of peers. Uh, don't expect any support from your friend because now they're all your enemies. Uh, so you basically have to move around just like you would in the military. And, and that's one of the, pro the problem with the military system to start with because we had this uh, officer career development system. It's level over from, from the Cold War. So after you make major, you can expect to move every two years. Uh, there, there's no stability, uh, you know, family-wise because what I finally decided, well, if I'm gonna have to move around just like I was in the Army, I'm also just go back to the Army because they pay me more, and I can actually retire in less than 10 years. And when I signed up back to the Army, uh, I was bringing the surge in 2008. So they basically, they, they were pretty honest. They said, you know, when, if you come back, and, uh, you go straight uh, to Afghanistan. And I, under, I, said, I understood that, but uh, it was, I didn't know my uh, battalion commander volunteer was for 15 months deployment. Uh, as in those, instead of 12. Uh, and uh, I mean, it would have really changed anything eventually, but basically what, what I was getting at is I basically got into what I always consider the nightmare scenario. The nightmare scenario is uh, I uproot uh, my wife and put her in a new, new military base where she knows absolutely nobody, she has no job, no friends, no nothing, and I'm off to the tour of war again. And we did that. Uh, and that, that, that part was pretty tough. But anyway, uh, go back to the transition part. So the first time, uh, the, uh, the Army already had some kind of transitional program, but it was, it was okay, but it wasn't great. Basically, they just kind of looked at your resume. Uh, the second time around when I retired, it was a much, much better, much more well thought out and much more thorough uh, process. So it, it was definitely uh, easier the, the second time around. The first time, uh, it, it, it was kind of tough, so. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, we'll um, wrap that up. I'll um, finish with, if anyone has a question or two for our panelists that they would like to ask. Calm down, everybody wants. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, with that, I want to thank our veterans. Would you please give them a hand for being with us today? And thank you for um, coming to our roundtable today, and hopefully we'll see you back here next year. Thank you again to our veterans. Thank you. 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 Thank you.